Uh, uh, sorry, we can can we start the recording? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, got it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation. And yeah, so today I would like to talk about uh, uh, duality approach to the, to the spectral statistics. So let me start and uh, explain a little bit better what that uh, what that means and what uh, the talk is uh, is all about. So the question I want to start considering is. Um, whether, whether there are universal features in the spectra of quantum systems. So uh, this question is, uh, can be posed, uh, of course, for closed systems where one has a well-defined Hamiltonian. And then, of course, the spectrum is just the set of all the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. But um, one can equally consider uh, the same kind of question in uh, periodically driven systems. So in this case, the Hamiltonian is uh, dependent, depending on time and uh, is uh, periodic with some period. So what one can do is um, um, one can define uh, a time evolution operator for a period, this u, and then consider the spectrum of the time evolution operator. And in particular, uh, we can consider the phases of the eigenvalues of the time evolution operator, the so-called uh, pseudo energies. Uh, which um, we can um, assume to be from zero to two pi, just because of the definition of the locker. And then one can ask uh, the, the, the same question. So what, is, uh, what, uh, what, what, what are the properties of the distribution of these uh, pseudo energies? Uh, and if uh, there are something universal coming up. <clears throat> so in particular, um, this talk will be mainly focused on the second case. So I will, uh, uh, I will study the distributions of the pseudo energies of uh, periodically driven systems. Okay, so um, let me just try to move this. Okay, good. Um, okay, so, right, it works. Okay, um, so, um, So um, this question um, has been considered um, for, the for, for the first time um, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, where it was studied uh, in the context of a few particle systems. And in this context, um, um, people came up with, with uh, two main conjectures that were um, uh, somehow um, summarizing the behavior of two different classes of systems. So in one case, there is the so-called quantum chaos conjecture. And uh, this is saying that the spectral correlations of a few particle quantum systems with a chaotic classical limit match those of random matrices with the same time reversal symmetry. Covertly, um, there, there is another conjecture. So I, I'm calling that con conjecture. So these were based on the, on the observed behaviors, basically. The other conjecture instead is the, is the so-called the Barry Tabor conjecture. And he's saying that the spectra of few particle integrable systems are uncorrelated. So they, the distribution of, uh, of uh, pseudo energies or, 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 or of energies are following the um, Poissonian statistics. So, but um, later with the advent of more powerful computers, people started to study the same question in the context of uh, many particle quantum systems. So here I'm listing uh, basically the, the few, the, the first few works uh, in the subject, but there are uh, of course uh, very many. And the observation was that uh, a similar uh, behavior was observed also in the context of many particle quantum systems. So once again, the spectral, uh, so we, let's try to update these conjectures a bit. So the, the quantum case conjecture can be formulated as a consequence of uh, these uh, more recent uh, numerical studies uh, as follows. So the spectral correlations of a generic non-integrable quantum system match those of random matrices with the same time reversal symmetry. And uh, covertly, the spectra, the spectra of uh, integrable systems are uncorrelated. So once again, they follow the Poissonian statistics. Okay, but um, let me now try to um, 
define this question a little bit better. So, to, so to, to introduce some sort of measure of the spectral statistics so that uh, we can talk about it a little bit more uh, precisely. So in particular, the uh, quantity that, that I will consider um, in this talk is the so-called spectral form factor, which um, essentially can be thought of the um, absolute value squared of the trace of the time evolution operator to the T. Um, so it, it's written basically in this way. But uh, for reasons that um, will uh, clear in, in a moment, uh, it is important to introduce some sort of average uh, in this quantity. And essentially this is because this, um, this quantity is not self-averaging. So if one considers uh, in some ensembles of similar systems, these, uh, this quantity here uh, fluctuates um, hugely. So one has to introduce some sort of average of, um, of some form. So this can be an average of system of similar uh, over a distribution of similar systems or an average, for example, on time. It, do, it doesn't really matter for the, for the behavior. So um, what are the, 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 the most important features of this quantity? So first of all, T that compares, that appears here is not the real time. So it basically sets the energy scale that, uh, of the correlations that we are looking at. In particular, for large T, we are looking at small energy scales. And so we are probing the so-called level of repulsion. Basically, we are probing whether there are some in inverse correlations among an, an energy level, levels that are nearby. For small t, instead, uh, we are uh, probing correlations on large scales. And so we probe the so-called spectral rigidity, so the, the, the global properties of, of the distribution of energy levels. Uh, then another feature of this quantity, of course, is that it is the Fourier transform of the connected two-point function of the spectral density. Okay, so basically, essentially, it gives the same information as the connected two-point function of the spectral density. And if, if one wants um, to characterize higher point functions, a convenient uh, thing to do is to look at higher moments of the spectral form factor. Basically, quantities that are um, written in, in the same way, but where two here is replaced by two n, with, with n uh, being an integer number. OK. So, um, so but what is the behavior of, uh, of, uh, of this quantity? Um, let, let me start by considering the behavior of this quantity for random matrix theory, which, because it's uh, the one we want to compare with. So if you take a, an ensemble of uh, random matrices, um, the, the result for the spectral form factor depends essentially on the um, uh, uh, time reversal symmetry of, of the random matrices. In particular, for, uh, for the most uh, general um, ensembles of random matrices, for example, the circular unitary ensemble that don't have uh, a time reversal symmetry, then the spectral form factor is just given by uh, this simple expression. So it's the minimum between time and n, where n is the size of the matrix. Instead, uh, when uh, we consider uh, ensembles of random matrices with uh, time reversal symmetry, for example, the circular uh, orthogonal ensemble, then, uh, apart from um, corrections that are uh, small for, for large enough times or, 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 or matrix sizes, it's basically the same as before with a factor of two in front. Uh, so, by the way, sorry, I, I just see a question in the chat. So just uh, maybe yeah. I forgot to mention that you can actually stop and just unmute yourself and ask the question if you would like to. Uh, yeah, yes, ask please. Ask a question. Can, yes, <laughs> you can interrupt. It, it, me, it's right? a lot easier to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I can now ask this, this read this. So, a native yeah, question okay. What is the average in the KT over? Uh, I, I didn't understand the question, sorry. Okay, can so you repeat is, again? It is written on the chat. So, it says that a naive question What is yeah. the average in KT over? Uh, yeah, so uh, I mentioned that point. So, uh, so the, this average can be um, over an ensemble of similar systems. So basically you consider a system with uh, depending on a parameter and you average over possible values of this parameter or can be also an average on time. 
it doesn't really matter. Everything here will, will work in the, same, in, in the same essential way. Does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Ah, okay. Um, very good. So I was saying uh, the behavior of the spectrum fa form factor for uh, uh, ensembles of random matrices is, at least for those that we ne will need in the talk, um, is uh, essentially this one. So, but what happens then for a real quantum system that uh, has the same time reversal symmetry as these random matrices? But well, basically, what will happen is something of this form. So if I consider a real quantum anybody system and I try to measure the spectrum from factor, what will happen is the following. So there will be for short times, there will be uh, some sort of non-universal behavior. Then at some characteristic time, which is typically called tauless time, the system will start following the prediction of random matrix theory or the, the behavior set by random matrix theory. So there will be a universal linear ramp followed by a universal plateau. And this saturation here um, is, uh, as we see from, from the random matrix result, will happen when we take times that are of the order of the size of the matrix, which for our quantum system means that uh, we will uh, need to take times that are of the order of the dimension of the Hilbert space of the system. And this time here is um, typically called Heisenberg time. Okay, uh, covertly, uh, the same reasoning can be uh, adopted for uh, integrable systems. So for, if you take um, a set of N uncorrelated energy levels, then the spectral form factor uh, can be easily computed and it's just uh, equal to N, once again, the number of levels. So if I take a, a real integrable uh, many body system, for example, what I will observe is something of this form. There will be some sort of non-universal behavior at the beginning. And then there will be this universal plateau, which is, uh, which is the, one, the one I find for random matrices. Importantly, uh, something I didn't mention before is that um, if you consider quantum many body systems, so systems that have some extent, uh, extension in space, then the tallest time typically will be proportional to the uh, volume of the system to some power. And uh, the idea for that is, is basically that um, before uh, you will be able to see the system behaving as a complete random matrix, you will need to, to wait some times, uh, 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 times of the order of the size of the system or, 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 or of the size of the system uh, to some power because you, you will need uh, the information to spread uh, throughout the system. In particular, for typical uh, systems where the, 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 that are characterized by um, diffusive processes, then the, um, the Taulis time is typically expected to, uh, to be proportional to the volume of the system squared. Okay. Um, but so, all these expectations, um, for the moment, I'm just presenting them as um, as conjectures or as uh, um, something. Uh, that... Sorry, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so the onset of something universal for the generic case was given by the tau this time. Is there something similar for integrable systems? Um, in a sense, you can think of it in the same way. Yes. So there will be some characteristic time here um, for which um, one can expect the onset of something universal. In fact, uh, uh, at least uh, for, for, the, for the few examples that we can characterize, um, the onset of the universal behavior will be power law. So there won't be really a characteristic time. Okay, thank you very much. No. Could I ask uh, how can you measure this K? How can I measure this K? Well, what does it mean? In an experiment? In an experiment, yeah. Uh, that, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think actually uh, they were trying to measure it in a, in a quantum computer, but I, 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 I have no idea actually on uh, how precisely they, they were planning to measure it. What about like a solid state experiment or something like that? 
I mean, uh, it's kind of related to like a dynamical structure factor in a way. Yes. Uh, yeah, but it involves, uh, I, I don't really know, because it, it, it has the trace of the evolution operator. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I honestly don't know exactly how one could, uh, do, could measure that in a, in a real solid state experiment. But yeah, it could be interesting to, to discuss that uh, later if you have some ideas. Okay, thanks. Silly um, question here. Yeah. So, um, it I mean it's kind of clear why in the in the in the chaotic case you you drop and then you grow right mm -hmm. because you have the repulsion and then at some scale you don't see the repulsion anymore you just see the density. Correct. This, this is like in a liquid, in a, you know, the, the structure factor in a liquid, you know, spatial, not time structure factor in a liquid is a little bit like that, right? So, mm -hmm. and that's because, you know, particles have to occupy a space and, and not, you know, and, and the others cannot. But is it obvious why it has this simple shape, but it doesn't have oscillations at the start? Maybe it's just the Poissonian character and the fact that this is one dimensional, but. Uh, so uh, once again, so let me understand the question. So you are saying why this is no, just no, a drop? No, no, the previous one. No, no, the, the previous one. Yeah. So the, the, the generic one. So you're saying why, why is just going down like that instead of having oscillations here? Well, you know, it, maybe it's just my bias. But it might. Bias. No, no, but, but just a second. So it can have anything here. Eh? This is, I mean, I just call it non-universal and I just throw it like that, but okay. you can certainly also have oscillations in this in non-universal part. This okay. is just a sketch, not a real yeah, result. Yeah, this, right? this is definitely a sketch. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this part here is just, it's just to say that uh, I don't really know what happens actually. <laughs> actually. Okay. So yeah. Um, okay. Uh, but 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 thanks for uh, it, it 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 allows for some uh, clarification. Okay, uh, so um, so essentially what I'm saying is that uh, yeah, so in this case there will there's there typically is uh, a time scale for the onset of the universal behavior, but in in the case in the in the integrable case, well at least for those that for for the situations we have under control. Uh, you actually have a power law relaxation, so yeah. Okay, but so what I was saying is um, good. So for the moment, I'm presenting these as uh, evidence coming from, if you want, numerical studies. But uh, can we actually prove something about these conjectures? So, um, so, so until a few years ago, there were two main um, proofs of, of these conjectures. So one of them is based on um, semi-classical periodic orbit theory and is a, a very um, important program that has been started by Michael Berry in the 80s and then has been continued uh, for, for 20 years. He's, uh, he's basically uh, based on expressing the spectral form factor in terms of um, sums over periodic orbits uh, using this, uh, the Gurtzwiller formula for those who know it. Um, okay, so this is a possible approach. Another approach has been for um, a few particle um, quantum systems. In particular, there is this um, uh, rigorous proof for uh, fully connected incommensurate quantum graphs. But um, what about um, quantum many body systems that are far from the semi classical limit? So, for example, fermions or spin halves. And what about the Berry Tabor conjecture? So, because this is, um, these results here concern the quantum chaos conjecture, so the, the, the chaotic case. Well, um, in this case, uh, there has been some uh, interesting uh, recent progress uh, in the context of quantum circuits. And um, based on the so called, on, the, on a sort of um, space time duality, which I will explain in, in a second. In particular, what I will um, talk about today is uh, a series of works that um, I have done in collaboration with uh, Pavel Koss, who used to be in Ljubljana and now is in Munich, and uh, Tomasz Prosen, who is uh, in Ljubljana. Uh, 
Um, and uh, basically the upshot of, of, of these works so that I will present is that in, in for certain special classes of quantum circuits, you can have some uh, rigorous results or, or if you prefer some exact uh, results uh, for the spectrum form factors. Okay, so um, to start with, let me try to express the spectral form factor for a quantum circuit. So this is a very uh, com uh, condensed slide. Let me try to unpack it a bit. So the quantity that I wrote before, the spectral form factor, for a quantum uh, circuit can be represented like that. So what is that? Okay, so the um, gates represented in red are uh, for example, uh, depicting the trace of the time evolution operator to power t, while those depicted in blue are representing the complex conjugate of it. And so let's look at one of them. Let's look at the part in red. So what we, what we have here is uh, that we wrote our time evolution operator as uh, a um, subsequent applications of some local gates that are acting on a chain of quantum systems with uh, D in the internal states. So basically a chain of uh, qubits. And then we have two kinds of gates. So we have these uh, red gates here that are coupling two qubits together. So two side gates. And then we have these uh, uh, bolts here that are um, only applied instead to a single qubit. Then what we take is uh, we fix our um, two side gates to some um, uh, fixed value, while instead we take the uh, one side gates here, these bolts, to be random. And the, the, their distribution is as follows. So we take them to be random in space. So if I go in this direction, is, this is the space direction, and different bolts are, are um, independently distributed random matrices. While in the time direction, the bolts are repeated, so it's the same. So you, you see, in, in particular here, I, I'm repeating them every full time step. So this is the same as this, is the same as this, while this is the same as this, and is the same as this. Well, all this part here is just the uh, complex conjugate of what comes uh, on top. So is the setting clear? Uh, uh, it's important to, to make this one clear, otherwise, um, will be uh, difficult to, to follow the rest of the talk. Everything clear? Okay, good. Then uh, for convenience, um, one can uh, consider the so-called um, folded representation. Basically the idea is that one um, takes, for example, the, the blue part here of the circuit and bends it uh, on the back of the red one, so uh, doing something like that. So we can represent basically the same object as a, as a, a single sheet uh, where we are using gates that are uh, the two red and blue superimposed. So at the end of the day, we can represent the spectral form factor in this way, in, in terms of this uh, simple uh, quantum circuit type. Okay, so let me just start from that. Very good. And now uh, what I said before is that um, I'm considering these matrices here to be random, in particular, uh, to, to be random in space and, and uh, repeated in time, right? Uh, so, so that is, is really a Floquet system. And therefore, what this means is, and, and sorry, and this E now, in my case, I really take it as an average over these random matrices. So what this means is that I can, um, equivalently write this object by factorizing the average on each one of these rows. So I can do uh, something like that, yeah, sorry, like that, okay? So I will write the spectral form factor as uh, the product, you see, of, of these uh, 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 transfer matrices that are uh, propagating uh, in space, you see? So the, this transfer matrix T is propagating from, uh, let's say, this uh, column here to this column here, okay? And if you take, uh, uh, if you take uh, as we do uh, the distribution of this uh, random uh, one-cuded gate to be the same um, 
so so they are independently distributed, but they have same average and uh, same variance at every po at every point in in space. Then what uh, one can write is uh, one can rewrite the spectral form factor as the trace of the averaged uh, let's say transfer matrix to the power l, where l is the volume of the system. Okay. So. Um, Okay, let me just summarize what we did. So we, we can write the spectral form factor in terms of the uh, spectrum, because we are, we are considering uh, traces of powers, of a certain transfer matrix T. So the transfer matrix, uh, let me stress this point, is independent now of the volume, okay? It only depends on time. So it, it basically uh, is defined on a lattice of length uh, proportional to T, uh, 2T for, two times t for the for to be precise and in particular the large volume behavior of the spectral form factor will be given by the largest eigenvalues of these transfer matrices these, these transfer matrices finally let me also mention that, that um, the same kind of treatment can be uh, re repeated in basically the same way if one considers the so-called uh, the fluctuations of the spectral form factors that I was mentioning before. So, so if one takes uh, something that is uh, like the spectral form factor, but here instead of power two, I put power two n, then I can basically repeat the same and I can depict it in exactly the same way. But now I have to interpret basically my green gates as uh, n copies of, 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 of what I have now. Okay, but, but uh, from the formal point of view, I can really repeat the same kind of approach. Okay, so now, the, uh, until now, what, uh, what I did here is uh, of course completely general. I didn't have to specify at all uh, what is the structure of these gates. And these can be done just based on the locality of, of the interactions in quantum circuits. So on the fact that uh, the time evolution is written in terms of these uh, two side gates. And I didn't need anything more than that. Uh, of course, now, uh, if I want to characterize the spectrum of this uh, transfer matrix, I will need to um, use some of the properties of, of, the, of, the, of the gates. Do you need to actually consider periodic boundary conditions to write down this transfer matrix? That's a that's, that's very good point. Yes, you see, uh, that's, that's a good point, um, which I didn't mention. So here, yes, I'm considering uh, periodic boundary conditions in space, and I also have periodic boundary conditions in time just because of the trace, uh, because the spectral form factor was uh, the um, absolute value squared of, of the trace of the time evolution operator to the power t, right? So because of that, I have periodic boundary conditions in time here, but I also took a system with uh, periodic boundary conditions in space. So if I don't uh, pay, take periodic boundary conditions in space, then basically I can repeat the same thing, but here I will not have a trace. I will have uh, a matrix element. Or I guess you can just multiply the boundary on this tra uh, the transfer matrix and then you multiply the left and right boundaries. Correct, so I have, the, I, have, I have basically instead of a trace of T to the L, I have matrix elements. So I, I just put some boundary state here, then I have T to the L and then I have some other boundary state here. Does that uh, answer? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, very good. Um, any other question on the setting? Um, this is a good point to ask questions on this general setting because then I will move to some uh, uh, special cases. So, okay, no questions? Good, so I'll, I'll move on. Then, okay, so the main point is that in certain special cases, one can uh, characterize the largest taken values of these uh, transfer matrix in space exactly. And in particular, I will present a few examples of them uh, today. So, in, uh, so the first case that I want to consider is I want to consider uh, local gates of, of, of this form, okay? So here I'm taking, uh, just for, for generality, these two gates here uh, depicted in uh, two different green shades to be different, in particular U and W. But I take both of them of this form, where the little U's here are generic one-side uh, 
unitary operators, while this uh, two-site operator is uh, written in this special form here. In particular, S3 is the uh, third component of the spin, is uh, SZ. Um, J is some free parameter, which I take to be different from zero, while S here is the swap gate. So it's the gate that acting on two vectors, it just uh, uh, flips their position. So these uh, gates written in this form are dual unitary. What does it mean? Uh, so dual unitary means the, the following uh, simple uh, concept. So I, I, we can represent, for example, let's take uh, the matrix U and we can represent this matrix U as uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, block tensor. And U is unitary in the sense that if I take this tensor and I, uh, group indices in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in a way that it propagates from bottom to top. So if it propagates, um, yeah, here I flipped it. So A, B, let's say into C, D. Then when, you're, when I arrange it uh, as a matrix, then it's just this matrix here, which is unitary. But I can view the same block, right? As a matrix that propagates from left to right or from right, right to left, if you prefer. So basically then the same kind of tensor will define a different matrix, which is just the reshuffling of the previous one, okay? So this will, with, this will propagate the indices, for example, CA into DB, and will be given by some different matrix U tilde that is obtained by reshuffling the elements of U. So typically, if you start from a unitary matrix, you and you do this, you find something that is not unitary. But dual unitary circuits are such that both U and U tilde are unitary matrices. Okay. So in particular, this form that I'm taking here is uh, the most general uh, dual unitary gate that one can find for uh, D equal to two. So for uh, qubits. While instead for D larger than two, this is just a, a family of them. It's not, it's not all of them. Uh, okay, just for, for, for the sake of intuition, gates of this form uh, can be used, for example, to build a time evolution operator uh, like this one, where, where sigma zero are Pauli matrices. So uh, some of you might recognize this one is just the, the kick teasing model. Um, where one has to set the, uh, the, the coupling and the, and, and, the, and the transverse field equal to pi over four. So it, it's, a, it's the kick dizzy model at some special values of the couplings. Okay, good. So, um, so for these systems, so for, for this uh, special form of the gates, one can prove the following, uh, the following theorem. So the maximal eigenvalue of the space transfer matrix is one, and the corresponding, eigen, the corresponding eigenvectors are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the solution of the following algebraic problem. So basically one wants to find all matrices A that commute um, with uh, these two uh, operators MA and MAB. So, so let me try to understand, to explain what, what, what these are. So MA is basically uh, the magnetization on the time lattice, okay? And A here is just the component. So in particular, for the simple case of qubits, here would be just uh, MX, MY, and MZ, defined on the time lattice, so on the lattice that is going in the time direction. While MAB, is some sort of, uh, I don't know how to call it, uh, double magnetization. So you see, is the sum over the, the, again, time lattice of something that is uh, uh, sigma sigma. And I, can, and I can take A, A and B to be, um, to be different from each other. So they, they vary independently from, um, from one to three. So they can be X, Y, or Z, for example, in the case of qubits. More in general, instead, A and B can take um, uh, values from one to B squared minus one. Uh, also, here I have another small index here, this, this kind of I, 
um, that is basically, uh, I have two um, independent sub lattices in the time direction. So th this is just uh, telling me which one of the sub lattices I'm taking, but this is just a very technical uh, thing. Okay. And um, so let me just give the, 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 the very brief idea of how uh, one can map from, from the problem of finding the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix to this algebraic problem. Basically the idea is, uh, is actually very simple. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the idea is, uh, is actually very simple. Um, I think I missed, oh, there it is. C can you see the slide now? Sorry. Yes. No, you can't. Yes, we can. No, no we can't. Uh, we can We can see actually. Uh, yes, yes, sorry, but okay. No, I think it's, bad. it's the one I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, so let me just give a, um, a, a, very, a very brief idea of how you do that. So basically the idea is that you want to find uh, eigenvectors of the transfer matrix um, that let's say correspond to eigenvalue one. And uh, well, basically what you do is you unfold. So you have this transfer matrix here that uh, if you remember um, from the setting before, these green gates are, are two uh, red and blue gates superimposed. So now you basically imagine to unfold them in, in this direction. So you pass from a problem of this form to a problem of this form. So this one becomes a, a sort of um, um, commutation relation. So it, it, now, now, you know, what you are looking for are basically matrices and, uh, and you are commuting them with, uh, with uh, things obtained from a transvolution operator, basically. Um, and so if you massage the commutation relations, then, then you can basically get to, to, to this one. Um, all right, but then um, one can also prove that the only solutions to the, to the previous uh, algebraic conditions are um, just uh, periodic shifts on the time lattice. So in other words, what, what I'm saying is that the only matrices here that they can commute with every one of these M's are just periodic shifts on, on the lattice. You see that periodic shifts uh, definitely work because uh, these magnetizations here are uh, translational invariant, right, on the time lattice. So what I'm saying is that if I if these definitely will commute with any uh, any periodic shift um, on the time lattice, and the 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 statement here is that these are indeed the only possible solutions. Okay, so one can basically prove that. Uh, uh, these uh, two sets of matrices uh, generate an algebra that is uh, complicated enough such that uh, the only possible solutions will be these uh, uh, shifts in time. Okay. So, but then uh, we basically have, um, we basically have uh, found all the possible um, eigenvectors to, of the transfer matrix. And, um, and, and we know exactly their number. In particular, we have found P of them. And this immediately tells us then that the spectral form factor in the, in the limit of uh, infinite volume is equal to T, which is exactly the um, result uh, that one would, found, would find in the um, uh, circular unitary ensemble of random matrices. Moreover, uh, note that here we find this result for any time, okay? So there is no tauless time in this, in the, in this kind of systems they are basically giving you the random matrix result from time zero. So for this reason, one can think of these systems as uh, critically chaotic. There is really no, um, uh, no finite uh, time scale for the onset of the universal behavior. They follow the universal behavior since the very beginning. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Uh, I have yeah, uh, like 10 minutes. All right, thanks. Okay, so um, in fact, one can repeat basically the same analysis for all the fluctuations. And uh, one can again map the problem of finding the maximal eigenvalue of the transfer matrix into a, an appropriate algebraic problem. And uh, once again, uh, everything is written very similarly. Just uh, I just have to add an index N here. And the index n here is just labeling. Um, uh, now we have uh, basically I, I will have um, 
multiple so, so as i said before the only difference when one looks at, at, at fluctuations is that these green gates are are corresponding to multiple uh, pairs of uh, uh, blue and red gates that are piled up um, on top of each other and this ran, this n index is just basically saying that um, so once again one can uh, reformulate the problem in terms of a simple uh, commutation problem and for this problem here, uh, one can find that some of the solutions are uh, given uh, by that. So where these operators here are again, uh, so now it's, it's um, harder to picture, but one can imagine that basically here, these uh, kind of operators here are invariant under shifts on, um, we, we, we are basically considering uh, N copies of these time lattices. And these operators here are invariant under shifts on each one of these copies separately. And for this reason, um, these tensor product of shifts will again always be a solution. And it, moreover, I can also permute them. So this, this uh, gamma here is just a, a, a matrix that is uh, permuting different copies. So these, just by the structure of these uh, M's, uh, will will definitely commute with them. And um, the the task is now to prove that these are the only possible solutions. Um, so yeah, no numerics. So this we we can't prove. Uh, we we couldn't yet prove it explicitly. So um, what what we can do is that uh, we can look at numerics, and numerics indeed suggests that these are the only linearly independent uh, solutions. So. We have that the fluctuations of the spectral form factor uh, in these systems are at surely larger than n factorial times um, t to the n, which is the CUE uh, random matrix uh, result. But in fact, they really look like they are the same. So this is again proving that these systems are indeed uh, showing a spectral statistics that is uh, fully uh, random matrix. So not only just the spectral form factor, but all the fluctuations. Um, look like they are described by a random matrix. So, um, okay, one, one can also uh, do um, a very similar analysis by considering circuits that instead um, implement um, e, a time reversal invariant. Okay, so one can cook up some dual unitary circuits that, uh, by definition, are um, including some sort of some time reversal invariant and repeat once again the same analysis. And for these systems, basically the idea is that uh, uh, once we rewrite once again um, our, our initial problem of finding all the uh, eigenvectors of the transfer matrix in terms of this algebraic problem, we will have that instead of the magnetizations that we had before, we have some magnetizations that are invariant also under reflection symmetry on the time lattice. Right, so this is the basically what what the time reversal is is uh, is giving you, and uh, essentially this is uh, giving you the factor of two. Okay, so in this case the spectral form factor will basically be equal to two times the previous one, in agreement once again with the uh, circular orthogonal uh, ensemble of random matrices. Um, so finally, um, the last example that I want to consider is uh, something instead that uh, uh, is not uh, dual unitary. So let me consider gates um, that are of this form. So just uh, e to the i, j, s3, s3. Let, let me also fix uh, d equal to for, for simplicity. So I, I'm considering qubits. And I consider uh, gates on qubits that are of this uh, easing form. But what I do is, um, so you remember, um, Previously, I, I put some random one side um, um, operators everywhere in my, in, in, my, in my system. But here instead, I want to put these, these operators only uh, basically once every two columns, you see? So here I don't put them, here I put them, here I don't put them, and so on. So interestingly enough, this choice that looks perhaps uh, very general, produces localized systems 
uh, with a complete set of uh, local integral of motions that are of support three. And, and this is true for, uh, doesn't really uh, depend on the fact that these uh, uh, gates here are taken to be random. This is true also if you take this, um, these gates here to be fixed. It doesn't depend on, 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 on the noise or, or on the disorder, if you like. Okay, so and then, <clears throat> okay, so essentially the fact that you can uh, compute explicitly a set of local integrals of motion for, for the system is already suggesting that uh, also here one can probably do some exact calculation uh, also of the spectral form factor. Um, and so we, we call this system, so because of this, um, because of this very strong property of the fact that one can uh, exhibit a complete set of lions of support three, uh, we call these systems strongly localized systems, okay? And um, for these systems, one can prove the following. So Tn as only a four to the n times four to the n non-zero block with a unique maximal eigenvalue. And therefore for large L, the spectral form factor will behave like that. Uh, so will just be the maximal eigenvalue power L. And um, in particular, the question is whether this becomes um, Poissonian as we expect for a localized system for large enough times. So, the answer to this question is that it doesn't. So the spectral form factor, so if I set here uh, n equal to one, agrees with the Poissonian statistics. But the higher moments, the higher fluctuations are not agreeing with the Poissonian statistics. In fact, they are given by uh, some uh, lambda bar to, to the power L, where lambda bar here, here I'm reporting it for, for the, the first few values of n. While the Poissonian statistics uh, would require them to be equal to n factorial times uh, two to the uh, two nl, okay? So it only agrees with the Poissonian statistics for um, n equal to one, because you see for n equal to one, uh, you have that lambda n is equal to four and, and this uh, reproduces this result. So what, what this looks like is more um, a system where the time evolution operator is composed of disconnected um, Poissonian patches, if you want. So where the time evolution operator is, 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 uh, is written like that. So it's the tensor product of some matrices that are um, acting non-trivially non only on a number of size uh, psi. And then they are, they are independent of each other. So if for this system, if one considers the spectral form factor indeed finds uh, some qualitative, a qualitative behavior that is very similar to, to this one, in particular, one finds this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of behavior. So some function that depends on the, on the moment and on the support of, of, these, of these U operators here. And then it's uh, taken to power 2L. Okay, so basically what one can do here is uh, try to use this result to find what is the what is the size of the patches, and indeed um, we find that the, the size of, of, of our patches are are, uh, are between two and three. So um, yes, so basically, uh, good. But so. Um, no, no, the question, um, I, 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 the, the final question I want to consider before concluding is, um, is this behavior that we are seeing here um, generic in some sense? So is it something that uh, we actually see in, uh, in, uh, in, in, if we break, let's say the, the special property of, of this localized system, which is that uh, we took these columns uh, without any, any disorder. So, yeah, so that, and, the answer seems to be yes in some sense. So if one looks at the system that in, instead is generic, so um, where one puts um, this random uh, one side operator at every, at every position instead as uh, uh, only on, uh, let's say, even columns, then what one finds is that um, there is some sort of um, time window uh, for which also these generic systems are showing that the spectral form factor approaches 
uh, some sort of plateau that agrees uh, to, with this one of the disconnected patches. The difference is that at even longer times, what these systems do is they go to the uh, Poissonian result for fixed L. And the, the same behavior can be confirmed for many other uh, uh, generic um, uh, Floquet uh, MBL systems. So for, for generic Floquet systems that are, that are localized at, at least at, at fixed value of, uh, of L. And, um, and apparently the size, let's say, of the effective patch that is describing the, this intermediate plateau depends uh, on the range of the interaction. So if one, for example, considers uh, next nearest neighbor, uh, next nearest neighbor's interactions, the size of these effective patches is increasing. So yeah, uh, that was basically the last uh, point I wanted to mention. So um, with this, I would uh, just go to my conclusions. So um, essentially what I tried to, to show in this talk is that um, uh, space-time duality can lead to exact results for the spectral statistics of quantum circuits. I showed that generic dual unitary circuits behave as uh, circular unitary ensembles of random matrices. I showed that uh, if you impose these dual unitary circuits to have, some, uh, to have a time reversal symmetry, then they behave as uh, um, random matrices in the circular orthogonal ensemble. And finally, I introduced these sort of uh, different systems uh, that we call the strongly localized systems for which you can compute exactly the spectral statistics, which is uh, absolutely not random matrix, uh, for which the um, spectral form factor looks Poissonian, but the higher fluctuations are not Poissonian. And this, these systems are behaving really as some sort of uh, ensembles of disconnected patches. Okay, uh, with that, uh, I just uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take any question if you have them.